So what I'm going to be exploring with you all today is these um, frosted vintage botanical prints. So like here's an example of one that I put in here and I'll talk about the backgrounds and whatnot. And here's an example of what they look like. Um, so we're specifically going to be talking about um, vintage frosted botanicals that you can insert in your journal. So I've done a similar project with this where you can frame them and I'll be sharing that on my YouTube channel where you can look at how it can be freestanding art. But today specifically, we're gonna be looking at how we can incorporate these into our art journal. So the materials that I'm gonna talk about today specifically is um, graphics matte film for inkjet. Um, so the matte film for inkjet is a matte film that is, um, uh, like you can see here, it's kind of cloudy, right? But you can print imagery on it. So here I have printed on an inkjet printer um, a clear, crisp black and white image. And that's what we're gonna be using as a substrate. Now for my journals, um, I'm using a Strathmore visual journal, much like everybody has uh, had experience with before or you can use the Strathmore Mixed Media, but I don't care as much for this because of the perforations that are included because pages will tear out over time and I don't want that. I want things to stay secure so that I can remember. Um, but a mixed media paper or a heavier paper, either will do fine. Um, and then I'm also gonna be using the Marabou sketch markers and permanent markers. And I'll talk about the difference, but these are alcohol-based markers that um, uh, are, are permanent. They have like a permanent fixation, but they are alcohol-based, so they dry. And then I'm gonna be using um, silver brush, silver white. These are just some watercolor brushes. Um, anything you have at home to distribute that holds moisture would be fine, but this is specifically what I'm gonna be using today is a, a one half, a number four filbert, or excuse me, a number six filbert and a number four uh, flat. Uh, but anything that holds moisture would be fun. Okay. Now for images, um, something that has clear depiction illustration wise would be good. Anything with strong black or white contrast. I pulled this from a book. Um, it's a copyright free book on engravings from the 1600s. And so you can just pull imagery, um, you know, copyright free or, you know, for practice purposes, you could just pull anything. Um, but that's what I have here. And I've purposely pressed the book down. And do you see how this copy is leaving like the um, uh, gradient from where the book wasn't fully pressed against because it was still in a book. So I did that kind of purposely because I wanted to call attention to how that can show up on your film when you go to print it out as well. So if you get something like this, you can always trim off the excess pieces or page numbers that may show up. You can trim those out so that it's not visible, but we want like a clear uh, image. And I'm just gonna talk in the beginning about that. So um, what you can do is you can play with your size reduction so that you can minimize the image so that it's more formatable for a art journal. So I just reduced, um, all printing settings are different, so I don't have a way to clearly uh, help you with your own printer. But what I usually do is when I go to print a format, it'll say 100% or whatever percent it is, and I can just change the percentage until I get a guesstimate of how I want it reduced. Then I will test print it on just a regular piece of copy paper to make sure that it's the size I want. Clearly, this was a little bit large for me, and I felt like it would be overwhelming for a whole journal page. It would, it would take the whole thing. And so I purposely reduced it down until I got what I wanted. Once I did that, then I could arrange the sheets on, uh, on again, copy paper. And then I'm going to take the um, matte film for inkjet and I'm going to place it on a side and it will tell you there are two sides but one side for printing if you pull it carefully enough out of the package will be the front side but if you ever um, uh, lose it it's reminding you that there's matte coating on both sides so um, you can flip around but a lot of times it'll have like a little bit more of a matte or um, grainy texture on one side, but there is coating on both sides, but one side's a little bit better um, for it than the other. 
So you'll pull um, the matte coating side out and you'll need to also probably test to print. So I know that when I put paper in my printer, it prints on the side that is facing up. So if I was putting the um, clear piece of matte film in my printer, um, again, the matte coating is on both sides, but I could just feel and see like, is there a toothier side? To me, the front side has more of a toothier feel and the back is a little bit smoother. Um, and then what I do is I'll put it with the matted coating facing front because I know the imagery is gonna print on the front. I also do not need to change my settings. I made the mistake of putting it on photo setting one time. And when you're dealing with a photo setting because it's printing on photo paper, it tends to discharge heavier amounts of um, ink. And on this inkjet, it makes the image blurry. So there's no need to change settings. I thought I was being smart and proactive by doing that. And just regular paper settings is fine. And then also you'll need to be a mindful that when it feeds through the printer, when it comes out, you need to not touch it for like a minute because the ink is still wet on the surface. Any surface that is not porous, um, you know, you just need to let the uh, material absorb and set before you can actually handle it. So I'll just leave mine on the printing rack for, you know, about five minutes just for good measure. Um, now there is a little bit of tooth, so it's semi-porous because of the matte coating on both sides. And it is acid free and it is archival as well. So this is great whether you're working on journaling, scrapbooking, you can layer these into physical paintings, um, working on panel. I mean, there's a lot of creative uses that you can really get out of this, uh, but I purposely choose the mat, even though it is available in clear inkjet as well. Um, but I'm purposely choosing matte because I like the opaque qualities. So this is the, the clear. Okay, but I don't wanna get too caught up in things that we're not doing. So matte film for inkjet. That's what we're talking about. Okay, so I've already taken the action steps. I've found my image. I've printed it. I've reduced it. And this is what it looks like on the matte film. It's dry to the touch on the surface. There's no problem. And so this is what it looks like after I've applied the uh, material. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to scan down a little closer so that you can see. And I'm going to flip this over on the back side. So what that looks like is the front side has the printed image on it, correct? So the ink is now dry and face down, okay? And now with that, I am going to take, um, there's two difference here. There's the permanent markers and there's the sketch markers. I'm not using the permanent markers at this time. I'm just setting those aside. I'm only using sketch markers. Okay, so I'm going to take the sketch markers and I've put a little bit of isopropyl alcohol in a little jelly container here. And so I'm going to just take the lid off that. So I have my isopropyl alcohol. I have a paper towel nearby and I have my silver brush brushes. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to select the color or colors that I want for my imagery so that I can stain it. And the cool thing about this being the back side is that it doesn't have to be exact, but I have some color choices here. So I'm just going to say, well, I'm definitely interested in these two shades of green for my leaves. And maybe I'd like to make my flowers um, pink. I'll make them pink because I made them blue in the last series. Okay, and so I can really just pull a variety of colors out. I'm going to use orange, etc. Okay, so I'll just do a couple test drives here. All right, so I've got my colors out. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with the darker sections of my green. These are dual tipped as well. Again, they're alcohol based, so they dry very rapidly, meaning the fluid inside is alcohol, so it sets to a permanency pretty quick. And you can see the demarcation that shows you what a broad tip and a fine tip look like. And I'm gonna use the broad tip. And it tends to flood out the color on this material because the material's semi-slick to the surface. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna kind of scratch some of the dark areas of my leaf. And again, there's a, a liberation here because I don't feel as inclined to have any kind of perfect. Um, I'm just kind of generously putting out some material on my leaves. I can just put some marking. And again, it's coming from the backside. 
Okay, and once I have just a general idea, I can all go, always go back and revisit more. Then I'm going to take my alcohol and my uh, silver white silver brush, and I like these watercolor brushes because they hold a lot of moisture. So I'm pulling out from my rubbing alcohol with the silver brush, and I'm just going to lightly dap it to remove some of the excess moisture. So it's just letting some of that rubbing alcohol come off. You can already see how this is kind of dried and set. And I'm just gonna tickle the edges to get some of that alcohol effect on the slick surface. So some of the mark making I'll leave more permanent. And then some I'm just gonna tickle to allow a little bit more of a ghost-like, um, kind of a ethereal look. Okay, and I'm tapping and I'm moving through, and it doesn't matter about going outside the lines, you know, I'm just kind of generously applying. I might get a halo that supersedes the line, and that's okay. No rules in art journaling, and if I'm attached to the outcome of this frosted vintage botanical, and I've already got an idea in my mind of what it looks like, and there's no freedom for it to be anything else. So I'm just trying to remind myself of that as I go through, because that's where I go. Is I'm like, oh, yes, but it's not turning out like the image in my head. It's wrong. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to take a little bit of uh, my light green now. And I'm going to kind of let this set maybe just like 10 seconds. Because it is alcohol that I'm using, and it's alcohol inside the pen, it has an evaporation rate. It's already dry to the touch. So the thinner the layer, the more that it quote unquote sets. So there's no problem uh, with that. And now I'm gonna flood some lighter color on top of it. So I'm using some of the lime green now, and I'm just kind of filling in any areas that might've gotten neglected. And um, I'm just gonna you know, merge and overlap and just let it be, you know. And then I can repeat the process to where, again, I'm tapping in my rubbing alcohol. I'm um, then tapping an excess on the paper towel. And I'm just, again, coming back and just letting some of these pieces kind of, you know, marry and unite. Okay. So I'm going to quickly repeat the process with the pinks. And I'm going to use the darker one first. And I'm constantly using the thicker side because it just really just floods with color. I mean, really just like a couple of taps. And I have a generous amount, all that I ever needed, and then some. And I can just kind of you know, place that in some settings just so that you can see what the thinner side look like. If you want a little bit more of that control, and you can still get some fine mark making, maybe in some of these smaller sections where the tip gives me a little bit more anxiety with the larger. So I can just put a little bit more of a refined, but all I'm really doing is depositing color, okay? So let's say that I put too much and I'm like, oh my God, you ruined it. Look at all that that I put down. So you can just take a little bit of your rubbing alcohol and you can actually mop like you're mopping a dirty floor and deposit. So you can reduce the amount that you've put down and you can just kind of wipe that surplus off. So there's really no mistakes. If I wanted to, I could potentially clean the whole thing back off to its original surface just by adding more alcohol. But you'll find with these reductive properties that if you're very, um, dispersing with the material that you'll get some parts that are more you know set and more uh, intense and then you'll get some that are a little bit more translucent or transparent so let me zoom in and show you what that looks like by holding it closer to the camera so do you see those areas where it's kind of like you know more like crusty and it's it's got untouched and then there's like these really cloudy area. So, you know, that's very nice the way that all shows up. And you can see where some has bled outside the lines. And I'm, I'm not worried about that at all. It's so subtle because the black and white lines are contained the way the printout went. Okay. So then you can go back and repeat your process with a lighter pink. Um, and then I can take another color, like maybe some oranges or, or um, browns. And I like to add, you know, more than one color. So, you know, I wouldn't want to just make the, and this is my personal preference, but I wouldn't want to make the moth of the caterpillar just, you know, orange. I want to add maybe some, you know, yellow 
or maybe some brown. You know, I always like integrating more than one color just so that I can get some really unexpected bleeding. Um, and it just adds to me the depth and the visual, you know, but again, I can just be like, woo, you know, whatever. I'm not really even going for anything specific. And then when I come back and use my brush, I can just kind of playfully marry those really in a quick fashion. And now I'll just kind of marry some of this and the yellow and the brown, they're all merging. Just maybe traces of an outline or maybe not, no attachment, you see? Now let's say that I want to uh, change, like there's um, a pretty substantial amount of bleeding here. And let's say that I find that really bothersome. Again, I can just clean my brush until it's, um, just rubbing alcohol on the brush. And I can again mop up. That's why I like the straight edge of this flat because I can just mop up what I need. And just get it down to a reduction. So really, you know, there's a lot of safety in this because it doesn't require me to be masterful at drawing and it doesn't require me to stay in the lines and it doesn't require me to um, be dedicated or attached to the outcome. I can continue to change it and manipulate it. And when you're done with that effect, um, and you can see how when I use different colors here, you have the same kind of quote unquote pooling that happened. Look at that saturation of the blue and the flowers and the way that I just kind of softened it. So you can see, and I even made up some fictitious background just by spreading some, some material there. And then when you flip it over, you see that it has an even more subtle vintage look to it. It's almost like those hand tinted photographs. And so you can choose, you know, the outcome or, you know, whatever you want to um, make that happen. Okay. So this is uh, the matte film for inkjet. Now let me show something else that you can do. Maybe you know, something so permanent isn't what you want to go for. Or maybe you find an image that you like, but it's not this black and white illustration style that you are looking for. So maybe perhaps you have um, something that you're printing off. This is an example of a color image um, that was just printed off that was an illustration, right? And then this would be an example of an actual photograph that was just turned black and white. So what you can have the choice to do, and this is where the permanent markers come in handy, is that you can choose to um, trace or outline the um, image yourself. And I'm going to show you very quickly how to go about doing that. So what I want to start off with is I want to show you how the matte film, when you lay it on top of something, can act as a transparency. And you'll notice that I do a lot of techniques with a lot of materials like this because I really feel for the person that aspires to draw, but they haven't gotten to the place where they're satisfied with their results all the time. So I think that journaling is very important for that. I love what I think I heard people talk about with daily journaling because you get to practice that drawing skill daily. But also the person, the success oriented part of me wants something gratifying, right? I don't want to wait until I get better at drawing. I want a nice outcome. So this process allows me to practice my drawing while also improving my outcome. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to now use the permanent marker and when I'm talking about the permanent sketch marker, um, there's a huge variety pack here. And these are very similar, although you'll notice that the tips are even smaller. So this tip is similar to the small tip in the sketch marker that I just used, but also this pen is even smaller, very similar to like a micron pen. And so I have the black um, permanent marker out that I'm going to use. And, you know, I'm just wanting to show you, I'm not going to use this as the example, but I just want to show you how it could be a little bit more challenging to use a photograph because I have to determine where the outlines are and I have to determine what I want to trace and what I want to be visible. And that may or may not be stressful for you. Whereas if I'm copying an illustration, the work's already done for me that I can just, you know, the lines are there so I can just work with what I need to work with. Now, 
you probably want to consider uh, taping the image down, which I neglected to bring some painter's tape or scotch tape in here. So I'm gonna, of course, not do that. But if it moves around, um, you can always line it back up. But an important thing to think about, I'm gonna go for my skinnier edge on this permanent marker. So these are different from the sketch markers in that they are um, a lot more permanent. The, the fluid doesn't flood out quite as much, but the color's equally intense. And um, I do these when I'm gonna do mark making, although they still can be removed with rubbing alcohol. So what I'm gonna do is instead of printing on the um, inkjet film, the matte inkjet film, um, I'm just gonna trace on top of it. So I'm gonna just trace through this and create mark making. And what I'm gonna do because I'm right-handed is I'm gonna start in the upper right-hand corner and work my way down. Right. And why am I going to do that? Because it's going to stay wet for a while and I don't want to put my palm on it and rub it. OK, and I'm not going to do this whole thing. I'm just going to show to get you started how I can just move through very freely and very liberated. It doesn't have to be, you know, exact. And I'm just going to start my mark making. You know, and it just feels, you know, very liberated. So I am um, tracing with the permanent marker and creating an outline. And I'm just going to do enough so that I have a little bit of um, a little bit of green and a little bit of red, just so I can get the point across to you. So this made me feel very, you know, festive for the holidays without being specifically holiday oriented. Okay, but I hope you can see how I've begun the tracing process and you get an outcome that's very similar to what we did when we printed, although I don't have to have all the, um, you know, details. I don't have to do every little crosshatch and mark. Okay, so you see where I'm going with this, how I could continue this process and I'm working down. So I would come all the way down to the corner until I'm done. And then I would want to set that aside so that it um, can set because the permanent marker, it, it, it will set, it's alcohol based, it won't take long, but I'm gonna set it aside for a minute or so, just so that I can allow that to happen. While that's setting, I'm gonna show you how I could trace right from the book. So here was another piece that I've already done. And what I did was I traced a larger piece, but you can see the print that I actually used and look at all the detailed bugs and the extra shading. Well, I didn't want all of that. So I chose not to incorporate the bugs. I left those out. And I also didn't want the extra shading and the extra hatching and cross hatching. So I made a conscious choice to leave that out. And you see how much more simplified my image is? Okay, now this is the same process where I have allowed this to set. So it's absolutely no different from this where the printed side is up and here the colored side is up. Does that make sense for everybody? So this is the permanent marker. Now to go back for the uh, important question that Tony answer, asked was that this was, um, uh, you might be thinking, um, why do I need to trace on matte film that is for inkjet? Okay, you don't. Um, you can make use of this one product for everything and you certainly can trace on it but I just would like you to uh, know that there is also a matte film that is not inkjet, okay? So it's just sold in the pack and you, you could not print on this, but it's the same product. It's just not treated to hold inkjet. Does that make sense? So if you already know that you don't wanna print images, you could use this, it's called Duralar Matte Film. It is made by the same company. Uh, the only difference is that the one film is for printers and the one is not. And you could use the printer film for both, but you cannot use this for both. But it still accepts ink, it holds colored pencil, you can erase on it, it cuts cleanly, it's archival. So that is the difference to what I think was, um, is, is being asked is that you, you could use it for both. So I would let you choose which technique you're most comfortable with and now that this is set, I can simply flip it and do the same thing. Or even with my colored image, having the, um, the flower that we were using, I could flip it 
also and do the same thing. So once it's flipped over, then I can do my coloring. Now you may have to reverse this image and flip if you can't work backwards, but for me, it's really simply the same thing. So what I'm gonna choose to do at this point is take like a red and I'm gonna repeat the same process. It's not gonna be any different that I'm gonna put the red on the background and flood the parts of the flower, right? And then I'm gonna take the green and maybe because it's a smaller space, what I'll do is, you know, use the smaller tip to incorporate, you know, and I can put some mark making or, you know, whatever. Okay. And then I'll just take the rubbing alcohol and the process is exactly the same. The instructions are exactly the same. I'm going to tip my, um, in here, I'm tipping my brush and the rubbing alcohol to get all this other color off. And then I will tip, blot the excess, and then I'm just manipulating. And because the permanent marker is on the other side, it's not disturbing that black mark. Does that make sense? It's still serving exactly as the other project did. But this gives you more freedom because you can control the amount of detail rather than printing it out. Or I think that this works really beautifully with what I think Helen's going to show you because you could even take your own sketches in your sketchbook and you could lay this film over and resketch your sketches. So you, it's your own personal drawings, but maybe you did a really good job in your sketchbook and you're like, oh, I wish there was some way to transfer this. Um, and so this might lend itself to something similar, but I'm not implying that this is what she's going to show you. I'm just, I think it would also um, be a way to get your own personal drawing out. Okay, so now I'm going to clean the brush off and then I'm just going to do a little dip, dip, dap here with the green. Okay. And I can just kind of flood that out and then I can add additional color. And you see, we've gotten the same result. I could do the same thing with the big one here where I could incorporate my own colors and, you know, just repeat the process. So it's really no different for, for the process as we go through. So what I want to show now is how we might incorporate some of these into our journal successfully. So I'm just going to set this aside. I'm letting this set. It's a little bit uh, wet, but pretty much it's going to be dry to the touch right now. But I'm just going to lay them aside. And I'm trying to decide where I would want something in my journal. And, you know, another reason for this is that, you know, with the journal, once I start drawing or doing the mark making, I'm kind of attached to where it goes. So there's no room for really trying it out. So when it's on a freestanding piece, then I can kind of test and see, you know, is this going to look good there or where might this stand out? And so what I found is that this tends to work better on lighter backgrounds. The darker the background, as you can see, it doesn't really showcase the material quite as much. Um, it just depends on the colors like here, I just feel like that doesn't really showcase that quite as well. But when it's solid or light, um, but you find what works for you because you might want it to be subtle, you see? But now I can actually test that. I've got like a, a, a free insert that I could just test on different pages to see where it might, you know, best showcase. So I'm gonna come back to one of these pages that I already had pre-selected. So here's something that I wanted to test on because I thought, well, this would be kind of nice. And I can go back to the earlier vintage print that I did and I can see what that might look like on here and say, oh, okay, so I could probably, um, you know, trim that a little bit and, and put it out. But I see what those light backgrounds uh, show and look like when I have it cut out. And whether I want to cut out a singular piece, I could certainly do that where I cut out the square. So it's very easy to cut and you can use exacto knife or scissors and trim off. And you can make like a window. Okay, and you could put something around and then I might even overlap with a printed paper or a border so that if I wanted to um, add another piece to it, I could take a strip of paper, which, you know, this isn't paper, but you could make a border on top to cover up that awkward edge so that you can kind of put some decorative papers 
um, or you could paint the edges so that you have a solid form. Now, another choice that might interest you, again, if the image is really clear, is that you could take scissors or cuticle scissors and cut out the image itself and just have the silhouette on top so that the whole thing would be colored and cut. And of course, I'm not gonna, um, I'm not gonna take up the time to cut that out now, but I hope that you can all envision what I'm talking about, that it would be a full silhouette and no box at all. And then you could just lay that transparent overlay on top and just look at how the beautiful background of the page almost serves as the color. You might wanna embellish it a little bit, um, but it almost serves on top. Another choice is that you could take the permanent markers and you could color on the front and not add alcohol at all. You could, you could embellish parts of it on the top and layer on top of that and not have to touch it up with rubbing alcohol at all. Because if I touch the surface of this with rubbing alcohol, it's gonna take away the black mark as well. Does that make sense for everybody? So I'm, I'm purposely trying not. So with the final part of what I'm gonna talk about, I'm gonna talk about adhering this into the journal because even though these are permanent markers, sometimes the ink, uh, both on the front or the back can be disturbed by fluid media. So I could take something like a matte medium or um, soft gel gloss or any of my adhesives that I'm accustomed to, and I could do one of two things. I could put like a small dot, um, whether applied with a brush or applied with, um, you know, uh, on, directly on the material, but I'm just going to put one small dot here in the corner. And then what I'm going to do is take my brush and I'm just going to flow through and deposit a thin layer in all four corners. And then you may want to choose to, you know, just do some dots in between. If it's a thin enough layer, it won't really show up with the translucent um, material. So I'm almost treating it like little, you know, points of where I want the adhesion to take place, but that little dot was enough to give me everything I need to keep that setting down. And then I can just simply flip it over, and that's why I've already decided like where I might want this to go, and then I can lay it down and just press it down. Now any um, pieces that show up, it will dry to a clear finish, and so it's just the moisture that's showing up. So that's what's appearing when I'm uh, actually gluing the image down. Now, another thing that uh, graphics makes that's really helpful is a product called Artist Tack. Um, and that's uh, just the word artist and then TAC. And I'm sorry that I don't have the packaging, but it just shows up in sheets like this. But what it is, and I can cut, little pieces off of it. This is really great for scrapbooking or if you were going to use, um, if you were going to use like the silhouette, like we talked about cutting it out. And so the whole back would have ink on it, but you can cut these little pieces out. And this might be another option for you. And what it is, I'm gonna pull this back up even though I've already adhered it, just to use as an example. But this has um, little micro dots of adhesive on them and they're equally dispersed. And what you do is pull one edge off. It's like double-sided tape. But again, it's like these little micro dots of adhesive. And you can put it down on the corner, right? And you can do that for all four corners. And then you can pull off the other side and the micro dots, I don't know if you can see them with the reflectiveness, I'm gonna try and get the camera to pick them up. There you go, I kind of saw them. See those micro dots that are, that is the adhesion, so it gets full, even application, and then you just press that down. And it's an easier way to adhere these products, and there's no liquid, so you don't have to worry about disturbing any of the ink surfaces. And if you're uncertain if the um, material will bleed or not bleed. You can always test a surface so I can put some material down and um, I'll just blend two colors here. And then I'm just going to take a little bit of rubbing alcohol and apply it to test. So just blah blah blah. 
some more of that data collection. I'm gonna let that evaporate and dry. And I think I had a piece that was already cut out. Let's see. One thing about art desks, they get messy. <laughs> So this was a piece that I already let dry and you can just see there's some of the crispy where the material had no alcohol and then some more of the alcohol. And what I can do is I can put a little bit of matte medium and brush it on to see whether it disturbs the ink or not. So this was actually the ink side up. So I can see when I apply that, does it take away? And you see, it does leave a little bit of color disbursement. I don't know if you can tell, but it made some of the pink. It's not much, but it just causes a little bit disturbance, but overall it's pretty permanent, okay? So that just lets you know whether or not you can use a liquid adhesive straight on the ink, okay? Now we do another test if you want for the inkjet just to see if it smears the inkjet ink, but I think pretty much after it sets for the inkjet and it's dry, you can do stuff on top of it and it's not an issue. So um, that is what I have to offer as far as the um, papers go. I'm going to show you one more thing on layering and how you can take some other decorative papers. And this is what I mean about, you know, putting the borders on so that you don't see the adhesion. You could just cut strips of this out and maybe create a frame or something like that around it. Okay, but the, the effect is, is that you get a little bit of translucency or transparency, um, but you know, it just has a little bit more of that uh, ethereal effect to it. So that's uh, all that I have to share with you on those products. And I'll put a list of them in the um, uh, comments for you so that you can uh, see that also for yourself. So, so I'm curious to see what that is going to look like when it's finished or when the, when you finally get that page together. Sure. Well, so, so you're so liking. Sure. So here's an example where I used the printable clear film and you see how the image is still there. I embellished the highlights on her a little bit. Um, and then this is where I tested some other film. This was a Japanese print that I printed. Again, this was the clear film and Here's my frosted one. Now I enjoyed that, but now I don't like the background around it. So I wanted to continue to put layers here. So what that could look like to your um, question is that I could take some matte paint. So because this has an opaque kind of frosted tint to it, what I'm gonna choose to do very quickly, just to get a point across, is I'm gonna take a little bit of a Titan buff and put it down on the page. And then what I might do is take a larger one inch brush and create a little bit of an op opaque layer to really accentuate or tone down some of that darkness now that I've got this opaque film. And you see how just in that comparison by creating a little bit more of that opaque translucency already is making it look better. And then I could add other colors and things to it. So you know, still not answering your question. It would be nice to see how it continues to evolve. But I want you to see how and why I'm making some of the choices as I continue to test it, because I can still see all the patterning. Everything I did beneath had, um, had uh, value, but what I'm doing is I'm just continuing to problem solve. And then I might want to put some patterning or maybe I could stamp on top of this to create some more texture with black or, you know, I could really see combining some of the other techniques. And I don't know if you could see it because I love what Tony said about doing a lot of writing, but do you see how I had like a journal entry or some kind of something here? And it doesn't really matter what it said. I think you know, this was just an example, but it just says something like, I enjoy using the wet media in journaling. Yeah, so it was just like a thought. But, you know, I opaqued some of it out and I textured on top of it. So the end result is you can't really read my rantings. And it's not about the finished product. It's about me discharging that emotion during this. So to go back to what Helen said, it doesn't have to be about how I'm feeling today but you certainly can incorporate some of those feelings and you can use it as a therapeutic tool to let go of some of that emotion. And it doesn't have to mean that it's the visual finished product. And I think that's why people 
Um, of course, I'm projecting, but I think that's why some people find art journaling kind of intimidating because, you know, it's not about getting it out necessarily. It's about the whole concept of a journal. You know, it's it's all we're in control. We're we're always in control. Yet the art journal is a place to let go of control. So it's the perfect, you know, contradiction. 